Mandalorian season three, episode two has changed the series forever. But how exactly did it do it? On a technical level, it did a lot of things right. But the most important thing, Familia, is that it proved my theories from over a year ago. Disclaimer, this is not a full recap of the episode. This is a reaction and an analysis to the most important scenes of the episode and how they will affect the season as a whole. You got it? Let's dive into it. Numero uno, the beautiful exploration of Mandalore. Straight into the action and connecting the narrative from the first episode, R5 is able to analyze the atmosphere of Mandalore and prove Bo-Katan's theory. What theory, you may ask? She was convinced that Mandalore is actually still habitable. R5 runs a sample and proves once and for all that the atmosphere is breathable. The atmosphere is breathable. Bo-Katan was right. Which obviously has huge implications for setting the course for her story. Reclaiming the planet is possible. Number two, the dichotomy between expectations and reality. We had seen snippets of Mandalorian in its prime both in Rebels and other pieces of Star Wars media. And even getting to see it in wasteland form looking like this fortress of solitude with green crystals, it still looks like a majestic landscape. The droid will be fine. You could tell this was an opulent society right before the purge. Seeing Grogu and Mando, who had never seen the planet in its full glory, fly straight into the mines gave me a bunch of expectations and excitement. With those action set pieces, we know that they're keeping it straightforward. Get to the planet, bathe in the living waters of Mandalore, prove that you can do your atonement, and then get the hell out. Moving on to number three, weaving in mystery and suspense. <laughs> Naturally, completing that to-do list with zero obstacles was not gonna be the case. So it was great to see Dave Filoni, Jon Favreau, and the rest of the production crew embrace the eerie ambiance of the planet in order to make their journey a challenge. Which led to a great action set piece in which Mando is captured by a sebulba looking cyborg robot and chained in order to be experimented on. Pretty cool easter egg over here as the Mandalorian is changed in order to be harvested for the nutrients in his blood. In very similar fashion to the way that the machines do it in the Matrix movie franchise. Moving on to number four, we are establishing continuity. Of course, our baby Grogu survives and has to go back to Bo-Katan in order to come to the planet and rescue their friend Din Djarin. What happened to him? Which is where we get the other piece of the puzzle. We get almost the exact same approach to the mines that we saw with Din Djarin, but now through the eyes of Bo-Katan. <laughs> Remember, she was a part of the royal family of Mandalore. She has seen the planet at its full glory and understands what their culture has lost as a result of the Purge. She reminisces on her past, even tells Grogu that she has met other Jedi before, and is ready to overcome any of the obstacles that she knows will be hiding in the mines. Let's go. Number five, here is where we get a beautiful moment of redemption. Bo-Katan not only finds Mando, but she's able to use the Darksaber in order to defeat this crazy ass robot, helping a new friend in distress that was previously meant to be a symbol for everything that she hated for the Children of the Watch. Even though she is dejected and disappointed at how the Children of the Watch have corrupted the Mandalorian culture. You are a fool she is still able to put her own life in harm's way in order to protect Din Djarin. Going beyond that, she's able to use the Darksaber perfectly even though it doesn't belong to her in order to accomplish this deed. It absolutely shocked me to see her give it back without any hesitation and nurse Mando back to hell. It shows some real character growth, especially for somebody that was completely opposed to the idea of going back to her home planet in order to reclaim it. If you want to go to the mines, be my guest. Pero mi familia, ooh baby, this is where the episode got juicy. The moment of truth, Bo-Katan knows exactly how to get to the living waters of Mandalore because she's seen them before and agrees to take Mando in order to atone. You'd never find them on your own. She reads off a plaque which details how the chambers that hold the living waters of Mandalore were once a lair for the mighty Mythosaur, the sigil of the Mandalorians. It is said that Tar Vizsla was so powerful that he was able to tame the mighty Mythosaur as a symbol of his power. And it has then been a living legend carried throughout the Mandalorian generations for thousands of years. In a beautiful moment, Din Djarin proceeds to recite the Mandalorian Creed as he descends into the water. And the words of the Creed shall be forever forged 
in my heart. To the audience, it's a mix of peace, anxiety, and of course, accomplishment as he's able to finally get to the water and atone. So he slowly goes down, keeps uttering the words, and bam, falls to the depths of the cave. Bo-Katan obviously pulled a Michael Phelps and went straight into the water in order to help him. Homie, it appears the gravity in this planet is cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs because this dude was flying through those mines like it was nothing. The cave systems looked so large that they resembled something exactly out of the Lord of the Rings as Gandalf was falling through the mines of Moria. And then we finally get to see it as I theorized over a year ago with an eye opening out of the blue, we get to see the return of the Mythosaur. As I mentioned in my theory, the rationale is beautiful. Not only does Din Djarin get the chance to atone by bathing in the mines of Mandalore, then getting the dark saber through trial by combat, he now has to test himself in full Mandalorian legend in order to tame the mighty Mythosaur. By doing so, he will embody the sigil of his race and be able to lead them in order to recapture the essence of the planet, and hopefully bring it into a new age of prosperity. Sadly, we only got to see them escape the water, so we didn't see the beast in full action, but homie, I am very excited for episode three. Did you expect to see the Mythosaur? Do you think Din Djarin can tame the beast? Let me know what you thought about the episode in the comments down below.